Christians United for Israel. And Randy is going to be sharing some things with us today. And there very well could be somebody here saying, oh, oh this is really political. No, this is about God. And a calling that God placed on a man named Abram. And he renamed him Abraham. And he made a covenant with him. And that covenant was for Israel to reach the nations of the world. And when Jesus came, he was a part of fulfilling that covenant and setting it up so that Israel would be able to bless the nations. And Randy's going to be sharing some things about that, how God's a promise keeper. And Randy, I just welcome you. Randy, um, I, I, he shared with me and finally figured out where I met him before. Not only has he been working for Israel for a number of years, and I should say for Christians to pray for Israel, but he's also been a leader of a point man ministry. He was out of Sacramento, part of um, ongoing ministry with men and setting up point men who would really be prayer warriors for their community, for their families, and for their churches. So it's a privilege and an honor for us to have Randy here. And we just let God share what he wants to from you, Randy. Let me get something out of the way here for you, right. okay? This is, okay, God bless. Oh, thank you, Pastor Bill. Oh, okay, yes. The children can go to children's worship because Connie's waiting at the back door. <laughs> And I'm going to go ahead and tell you while they're leaving that we are having communion this morning. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are welcome to share that with us. If you've prepared yourself, and that's the other thing. Thank you, Peter. If those of you who are going to pass out those magazines would do that at this time, please, we have something that we want every one of you to have. So just go get through every row, and uh, we'll get those out, Randy, and hopefully it won't distract you too much. No, no, no. Okay? No so um, these are some tools, and uh, we have more that Randy will be sharing with you. Thank you, Pastor Bill. You. Can you hear me okay in the back? No. Are we good? Yes. All right, if we can go ahead and queue up my presentation, that would be great. I'd like to just take a step back and kind of hit the pause button. I know uh, I came in earlier, uh, way earlier than I needed to, and I interrupted. I kind of caught the worship team in prayer, and it was a very intimate moment. And I have to say it's really refreshing to be in worship with a worship team that seeks to be at the foot of the throne before they try to lead us there. And so that was, that was, God bless you and thank you for that. And thank you for your pastor. I don't know how many of you, this is your home church. The pastor builds your home pastor. He's, he just says, he, your joy is contagious. And I, 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 don't, I don't think I've crossed paths with a sweeter spirit. So thank you for the honor of being a guest in your house today. Um, I, you know what, this, I was ministered today here. I, was, I came here to try to minister to some people, but I was ministered to. And uh, Gary, my, my life is a reflection of your own. And uh, I was raised in a military home. My father was a colonel in the Air Force. And uh, I didn't plan this message to, take, to have these touch points in it for your sake. But the reality is, is that the Lord used a military officer to change the world. Amen. And uh, we're going to take a look at that. So in this message, there's a couple of touch points that I hope will resonate with you. And, uh, and I can see that... Though I thought I was planning and preparing the notes, it looks like somebody was looking over my shoulder and had bigger plans than I could make. Amen. So uh, with that said, let's just take a step back. And Lord Father, I just bring this to you today, and I ask you to hide me in anonymity. I ask you that you'd be the only one that would be glorified. You'd be the only one that would be given credit. I ask you that if I bring any words that are not good in your sight, dash them to the ground, and don't let them be recalled when the people leave the sanctuary today. If it is good in your sight, use them as seeds that they'd find good ground, that there'd be greater understanding and epiphanies and maybe even revelation about your firstborn and that you are a God that keeps his promises. And I lift this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You can't have a group of people this size without having somebody in here or somebody in here that knows somebody that doesn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. They don't know how they're going to make their mortgage payment. They don't know what the biopsy report's going to say. They've got a child that is, you know, looks like the only two, you know, courses for the fork in their road is either a prison or a cemetery. Uh, you've got a, you know, you've got a marriage that's on the rocks. And I didn't come here today to try to give you all these political cogs and sprockets that you're going to go out and become some political advocate for Israel. I came here to encourage and challenge you that if you endeavor to see what, what the Word of God says about Israel, His promises to Israel, 
what he's going to do to them and through them. Because I believe God uses Israel as a line in the sand. If you, how many of you believe, believe your Bible? How many of you believe that your Bible doesn't have any errors in it? How many, of you, how many people in this room have taken a highlighter to a scripture that you think was written just for you and you clung to it and you stood on it and you hung, hung on it? How many of you have taken a pencil or a pen and underlined scripture? How many of you have ever taken a bottle of white out to your Bible? <laughs> because replacement theology or supersession theology which suggests that God had to come up with a plan B. God didn't have to come up with a plan B. God, we're still in plan A. Amen. When the Jews rejected Jesus, people said God didn't see that coming. Even in his foreknowledge, he didn't see that coming. He, had to, he took a stagger back a bit. He slapped his head like a V8 commercial and, and had to come up with a plan B. That's not what happened at all. Things are going exactly as were foretold. I took a trip to Israel a couple years ago, and against my better judgment, I had a bunch of observant, you know, mainstream Jewish rabbis, not Messianic rabbis, mainstream conservative Orthodox rabbis. Mm -hmm. And and you saw see that stained glass over there? Wherever we went, we kept seeing these images of, of lambs representing, you know, as an icon for the Christian faith. And one of the rabbis finally says, Randy, what is it with you guys and lambs? <laughs> and I said, Well it's like this Rabbi. So when you guys were waiting for the Messiah, you were watching the horizon for the Lion of Judah and you didn't catch him when he came as the Lamb of God. And that's exactly what happened. They were watching for the Lion of Judah. They didn't see him when, they came, when, when he came as the Lamb of God. And I jokingly tell him, I said, I don't make any secret about it, and I don't make any apology for it. I believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah. I don't sugarcoat that. I don't water it down. And they respect that, that candor. But what distinguishes me and, and our organization from other pro-Israel Christian organizations is I don't demand that my Jewish friends agree with me theologically before I'm going to commit to stand with them unwaveringly. And so we're going to take a look at what just some promises that have been fulfilled in our lifetime. That if you don't, I mean, you live up here in Crestline, California. You don't move to Crestline because you've got a wiring harness to get all up in other people's business. You know, you, and so, you know, this is like, this, you might as well live in Idaho or Alaska up here. And so, but you know what you live in? You live in the manifestation of Romans 120 and 121. I don't know how that slide, but write that down because it just you take a look at a sunrise or a sunset up here and you are going to be reminded that he uses the creation to reveal himself and that he leaves us without excuse. But let's just take a look. How many of you have been to Israel before? Well, she doesn't take, you know, she doesn't take up much room in the neighborhood that she's in. She makes up less than one-eighth of one percent of the, of the Middle East, the area that she's in. She's 290 miles long, 85 miles wide at her widest, nine miles wide at her narrowest, a little smaller than the state of New Jersey. Now, a lot of folks will, will say, Randy, you know, you pick a couple of scriptures. You pick Genesis 12.3. You can do a six-week you know, study series on the three lines in Genesis 12.3. Mm -hmm. I'll bless those that bless thee. Millions of American Christians believe that this nation has been a stalwart leader in the world because of, uh, with opportunity and privileges arguably beyond what we've ever earned or deserved. And m many, many millions of Christians in this country and around the world believe that that is not in any small way related to the fact that we're the first country to recognize the reestablishment of the Jewish homeland. I'll curse thee that curse thee. Take a look at the empires that chose to deal harshly with the Jewish people, and if they still exist today, they are a shell of what they once were. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How is it possible that a people group that doesn't even make up one quarter of one percent of the world population, 0.22 percent, but year in after year out, they get 25, 30, 35 percent of the Nobel Prizes, and virtually all of them have to do with extending the days of life or enhancing the quality of life, agriculture, energy, communication, medicine, and we're going to take a look at some of those because a lot of that has been manifested in, in our lifetime. But I, all I, you know, what I really am hoping that you're going to come, out, come away with today is that if you look at what the Word of God says about Israel and the Jewish people, the absolute worst thing that's going to happen to you today is that you're going to leave here realizing that your faith rests in a God that's in the business of doing what he said he's going to do. Your faith rests in a God that is a covenant-keeping God. He's a promise-keeping God. If he says everlasting, how long do you think he means? If he says forever, how long do you think he means? Okay. He's, he, he, if, if people that, and I'm not wagging my finger at anybody, because you can't have a group a quarter this size, 
without having some people that came from different expressions of Christendom. And maybe your Bible study didn't teach things this way. Maybe your Bible study suggested that maybe God did come up with a plan B. And I'm not shoving my finger in your chest, but I'm just telling you God doesn't lie. God doesn't need plan Bs. And God is able to do what he said he's going to do. So people will say, Randy, okay, you hanging on the Genesis 12, 3, you cherry pick scriptures. You've only got a couple of scriptures to make this case that, you know, that Israel's, you know, God's chosen people. Yes, we do have just a couple of scriptures. I'm just going to just go over a couple of them with you right now. <laughs> Note these down. <laughs> We're going to go through all these. We're going to be done by 1.5. Anybody who wants these, I can send you a link so you can go through them one by one and be encouraged. There's just a few. We have to really cherry pick to make this, but virtually there's 157 scriptures that deal directly with Israel from the first book to the very last. But one of the things that I think is, is very important, and this is easy for us to miss because the text does not, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little paraphrasing. I know I'm in a Baptist church. Can I have license to do a little paraphrasing because we're, I'm going to be done at 1125. Genesis 12, 3, the very first the very first chronicled manifestation of the promises in Genesis 12, 3 can, be, I believe, be found in Luke 7. And this is for the, the, the military academy, the ROTC cadets. How many, by show hands again, how many are you from the, going ahead and off to military academies? This is for you. And the next one is as well. Luke 7, 1 through 10. You've got a military officer, he's a centurion. By Roman law, Virgil, who's he supposed to believe is God? The centurion, the Roman officer, is supposed to believe that Caesar is God. But he's seen something in this rabbi from Nazareth that has gotten his attention. He's got a favorite servant at home that's on their deathbed. And what does he do? And you've got to pay attention to this because the text in Luke should not read the way that it does. He goes to the elders of the, of the, he goes to the Jewish elders of the town, and he, he appeals to them to get this rabbi Jesus to come into his house and heal his dying servant. What Luke doesn't say is that the text should have read, um, Rabbi, or I should say, you know, officer, with all due respect, the rabbi is not allowed to go into the house of an infidel. It's considered unclean. But you know what? Why don't you bring your servant to the town square and maybe we'll have him meet you there. It should have read something like that because it, by the oral law of the day, a rabbi can't go into the house of a Gentile. But, but these Jewish elders, what did they do? They tried to make a case for him to do, go around the forbidden. In the case that they make, he loves our nation. He's built us a synagogue. And they're trying to persuade him to go in, to do the forbidden, to go into this house. And as, as they make the case, the servant comes up. Rabbi, don't even bother yourself. I know that if you just say the word, that my servant will be healed. And what does it do? It blows Jesus away. I have not seen faith like that in all of Israel. Go home, and it'll be as you say. And he didn't, it was. We take a look, and some scholars wonder, if, these, if the centurion that we find in Acts 10 could possibly be the same one. We don't have any way to confirm that, but Cornelius, once again, we have a military officer. Again, he's commanded by law to think that Caesar's God. But what does he do? All of a sudden, he has a vision, and he, and he hears you know, the, the, a voice, an audible voice. It says that your prayers and your alms have been received as a memorial in heaven, and he's called to, bring, to, to send servants to, to, to bring Peter into his house. Peter's got the same problem that Jesus would have had. He can't go into the house of a Gentile. But what is the case that they make? I've got to have a vision of the board of prayer to read that right there. <laughs> the case that they make is that he's a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed. And then when the case that they're making to Peter, Cornelius the centurion, a just man who fears God, has a good reputation among the Jews, the nation of the Jews, and was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you into his house. Now catch this, this military officer, first Gentile, everyone else, arguably, everyone else is a Jew. Jesus wasn't a Christian. Mary wasn't a Catholic. John wasn't a Baptist. They were all Jews up until now. And this wild olive shoot that we're going to take a look at in Romans 11, that by the mercies of Jesus Christ, where the Gentiles are grafted in like a wild olive shoot, the tip of that wild olive shoot was this military officer. Because he had this great reputation among the Jewish nation, the Lord chose him and his household to be the first Gentiles that were grafted in to become co-heirs in the promises of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That should inspire you. That's good news. Amen. Romans 11, Apostle Paul, this is a whole other 90-minute presentation. 
where the church went off the rails. The Apostle Paul warns the early church, you are just a wild olive shoot grafted in by the mercies of Christ. You, you are, if, the, if the Lord can snap off an original branch, he can snap off a grafted in branch. Don't get all haughty and arrogant thinking that it's about you, that you're the root system holding everything up. You're not. But we, the early church didn't, did not heed that warning. And we, we got 1,700 plus years of the most unthinkable, unspeakable history of what one man is capable of doing to another under the banner of Christ to the Jewish people. Do, we're not going to camp there today, but take a look at it and you'll realize, you'll have an epiphany why when we knock on the door of the Jewish community, we don't get a red carpet open arm welcome. Because if I did a poll, at every, I, I do polls at pastor's lunches, tens of thousands of pastors over the last nine years that we've dealt with. And I ask them, how many of you, when you were going to get the degree, the sheepskin on your office wall that boasts your, you know, MA or BA or doctorate. How many of you were required to read or write a single paragraph about the Crusades or the Inquisitions or the pogroms or the Holocaust? All of those things happened under the watchful eye and within arm's reach of Christians. And people will go, Randy, take a time out, man. Those things didn't happen. Those people that did those things don't have the heart or mind of Christ. And to that, I agree. And to that, I also respectfully say, go tell that to the Jewish community. Because as far as they're concerned, we are the successors of that legacy. And we can't rewrite it, but we can commit to change the trend so it doesn't happen again. And if you're paying attention, and if you're going to the military academy, I'm not pretending to be prophetic. I'm going to go way out on a limb here and just suggest that your attention may occasionally be drawn to the Middle East. <laughs> and, uh, and the more you know about that, uh, you know, the better off we'll all be. And by the way, let's take a, let's hit the pause button again. Thank you in advance for the service you're about to provide. Thank you. So let's take a look again at that Genesis 12 through. Bless us, bless you, and I'll curse you to curse you. But let's look at the last line. And in you, all the families of the earth should be blessed. We're going to go through this really fast as a drive-by. But if it doesn't inspire you, have somebody check your pulse. <laughs> What you're looking at right there is drip irrigation technology. The desert that that hot house is in in Israel shouldn't grow anything. It's the same kind of soil that you're going to find in Nevada, New Mexico, or Arizona. But you've got greenhouse technology. Drip irrigation technology was invented in Israel in 1964. The top image is a kibbutz in 1964 where they're using drip irrigation technology for the first time. And the one in the bottom is my garden, that's my jalapeno plant that's eight feet tall, and it's using Israeli drip irrigation technology. What's kind of cool is that there are, there are agricultural experts that go and travel to Israel just to learn this technology, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, and they're bringing this technology back to places that have never been able to uh, provide bountiful crops. That, that greenhouse technology, that drip irrigation technology, Ben Shelley, the former president of the Navajo Nation, the largest First Nations Reservation in the country. It sweeps from Arizona into New Mexico. He went to Israel to see if this could really work in, in the farms of the Navajo Nation. And he came back excited and enthused to bring the news that there were Israeli agriculture experts that were going to come to Shiprock, New Mexico and teach them how to use this technology. They've never been able to grow anything but creosote and tumbleweeds on those farms. <laughs> on a good day, maybe some kale. Mmm, yum. Does that really make your mouth water? But here, take a look at what we have now. We've got the same exact, same exact greenhouse technologies, but it's already been being implemented. And they're harvesting onions, they're harvesting potatoes. They're actually getting hope that they're going to actually start seeing you know, Navajo farmers markets and farm to fork uh, restaurants here in the near future. That's in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Families means tribes, and that's quite literally the case right there. Not very far from here, if you head south, you're going to see the manifestation of something that happened in March of 2014. When Benjamin Netanyahu met with our governor, Jerry Brown, for the very first time, the first thing Jerry Brown wanted to talk about was our drought, water reclamation, water recycling. You know, how, how can we uh, enhance water conservation? Jerry Brown implemented a lot of the recommendations that we have, and within just a few weeks, you're going to see the largest desalinization plant that is in Carlsbad, California, Largest desalinization plant, entirely Israeli technology. And it's going to be, uh, when they t flip on the switch, San Diego is going to get 54 million gallons a day from this water desalinization plant. Israel has perfected desalinization to the degree that, that, that all of their agriculture, and they export 
You know what their number one, ex what, how many of you know what Israel's number one export is, what their number one exporting product is? Flowers. And they are entirely water dependent. None of their, at this point, their farms don't even rely on rain. They're totally water dependent now. Isaiah 66. You've read this many, many times, most of you, but you probably didn't realize that it's inside out. It's a, it's, it's a reverse mirror image of what it should say, because you don't give birth before you go into labor, do you? <laughs> Not usually. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in a day or a nation be born at once? And those millions of Christians that I mentioned earlier believe that that's exactly what happened on May 14th of 1948, when, when a nation was born at once, and she did go into labor after she gave birth when most of her Arab neighbors sought to you know, look at this abomination, this Jewish state in the center of what so recently was the Arab Emirate, the Ottoman Empire, and they sought to cast every last Jew into the sea. But the Lord prevailed. And so he's gathering them in from the four corners of the earth, You've heard a lot about the 800,000 plus Palestinian refugees, but not many of you have ever heard about the million Jewish refugees from the, the Arab nations in the Middle East that almost overnight were being gathered in. One of them is in Yemen, where you've got Yemenite Jews that are the holdovers from Solomon's caravan. They've never seen a plane up close. They saw one up, you know, up in the sky. They thought it was a weird bird. But all of a sudden, there's an emergency airlift because the Yemenite Jews, their lives were being threatened. They, they would be, the Great, Great Britain's government was being told, you've got to get these Jews out of here or their blood will be on your hands. 50,000 Yemeni Jews in an emergency airlift campaign. And uh, when the plane taxied up to, you know, to the tent refugee camp, they wouldn't get inside because they were petrified of it. And Robert McGuire, who they called the Irish Moses, he remembered his Sunday school days from Catholic school. And he said, you remember how, how the Lord used the, the wings of eagle to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? This is your eagle to bring you back home to Israel. And they said, well, heck, if you say it that way, then they got right on. <laughs> but I mean, if you, you take a look at, at the regathering, you know, in 1948, 30,000, less than 50 today. In, in Egypt, 75,048 today, less than 10. In Libya, 38,000 in 1948. Today, zero. In Iraq, 135,000 in Iraq. Today, zero. Three and a half million since 1948 have, have immigrated to Israel. And you can reduce it to coincidence if you like, but I would soon not. Genesis 13, 14. Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your descendants. Everybody said together? Forever. forever. And if he says forever, how long does he mean? He means forever. forever. Ezekiel 36, this is a very important because I don't want anybody here thinking that the Jews are getting these blessings because they earned it or they deserved it because they were obedient or because they were pure. The Lord is regathering Israel because he said he would. He's doing it to restore his namesake. He's not doing it for the sake of any people group. He's, not, he's, just do, he's doing it for the sole purpose that he said that he would do it. And he does what he says he's going to do. Take a look at this. This is the Ezra Dawn Valley in 1921. Jews are moving back to, to, to Palestine then with Western agriculture technology. The only land that's being sold to them is desert or malaria-infested swamp land. But you give a Jewish immigrant with Western agriculture technology a swamp, and this is what he does with it. He turns it from a death-producing malaria-infested swamp to the Ezraon Valley today, which is a breadbasket not unlike the San Joaquin Valley. Same thing, Ezekiel 36. And the desolate, the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by it. I could tell you that that picture was from the Navajo reservation that I mentioned ago, but it's not. It's from, it's from Israel in 19, or 1921. The same valley today doesn't look like Nevada. It looks like Napa. And, but look, what's the next passage say? And they shall say that this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and it has. There will be pastors with me in a couple of months going to Israel, and they're, they're not going to be able to fully appreciate what they're seeing out their bus window when they actually see the manifestation of God's word coming to fruition. Ezekiel 36 again. And the waste and desolate ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. This is Jaffa, right, which is now a, a suburb of Tel Aviv. It was a tent city. 
Look at this. Tel Aviv today. Exactly what the words of God said that it would happen. And it's a world-class destination, but more important than that, it makes Silicon Valley look like it's in the dark ages. It, is a, it contributes to the international community in ways that are absolutely uh, beyond our understanding. Zachariah 8, and I'm going to wrap because we've got, we have communion to receive her in just a couple of minutes. Okay. Well, your clock is fast then. So, but when we, you know, when I bring, uh, you know, pastors to Israel, we'll, uh, you know, we'll go to the old city, and I'll, I'll ask one of them, no matter how busy we are, no matter how agenda-driven our guide is, I'll ask them to just stop to let us catch our breath in the old city and have somebody pull out their iPhone nowadays or their Bible and uh, open it, you know, pull out their iPad and open their Bible app and read Zechariah 8. Because Zechariah 8, you, if, as you look at the words where you see old men and old women shall sit in the streets and each one with a cane in their hand because of great age and the boys and girls will fill the streets. As you're hearing these words that were written when the Jews were exiled from Jerusalem, by the way, and as they're being read, you can look around and they're, they're coming to life. Every one of them is true and it's all around you. And we'd be remiss if we missed that. I don't know if you, you know, track what's going on in the news in the Middle East, but it wasn't very long ago that when Benjamin Netanyahu wrapped up his address of the United Nations, he closed with Amos 9. And I think it's in, the reason that he chose it is because the words of this script have been fulfilled. They are, they've, been, they've already been manifested. Whoops. I'll bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands, and they will rebuild their ancient cities, and they will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them again, and they have, and they do. They will plant vineyards and gardens, they will eat their crops and drink their wine, and they have, and they do. I will firmly plant them there in their own land, and they will never again, and if he says never again, I have to rest that he means never again. Be uprooted from them, I, from the land that I've given them, says the Lord your God. It's very easy for us to look at what's happening, or for us to see things that are, you know, if the, if the Apostle Paul didn't want us to be anxious about nothing, it'd be easy to be anxious about a lot of things that we see in the Middle East right now. We see a Russian airliner go down, and a few hours later, ISIS is trying to claim credit for it. We see these things that are, are very, uh, that would, would make us want to wring our hands. But it's important, and one of the hymns, one of the praise songs that we, you know, that we sang today kind of echoed this passage. Jeremiah 31 reminds us that this is what the Lord says, He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, only if these decrees vanish from my sight will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation, declares the Lord. Amen. So we're going to just... Uh, we're going to just close. I was going to wrap up with, with a, a little message about Nehemiah, but, but I'm, going to, I'm just going to wrap up with a, a, a different parable that's going to go back to that, the lack of, a, of an open arm red carpet welcome. One of the things that our organization does every year is it equips Christians to be salt and light beyond the thresholds of the doors of their church, and that includes the political fabric of this nation. And I'm not going to get political, but I would suggest to you that if you're biblical, Sooner or later, it's going to have political ramifications. Yes. And so, if you want to learn more about our organization and see if it's a tool you want in your box, go to cufi.org. But probably one of the most important stories that distills why this organization, now 10 years old, started 10 years ago with 400 people, now we're the largest pro-Israel organization in the country at 2.5 million. Uh, a, a Holocaust survivor, white-haired lady, number on her left forearm, uh, guy was interviewing her and said, you know, at one of our conferences, big, big summit in D.C. He said, how does it make you feel to know that after all you've survived and endured, you do realize that with Iran on the rise the way that it is, your kids and grandkids are probably going to face the same thing that you did. Let that sink in for a second. And she didn't bat an eye, and she just kind of held her head up, and she said, it's not the same thing. We were alone that time. Mm. And we're not alone this time. So I know that we did a drive-by and that we put a lot into a short period of time. I'll be around a bit later uh, during the lunch. But if any of this resonates with what the Lord's put on your heart to do with Israel or maybe encouraging you and spurring you on to look at and see what it says, uh, I can guarantee you that there's not many more relevant things that you can join your voice to or lock your arms with.
So thank you for letting me be a guest in your house. I already warned Pastor Bill that I'll be way back in Sacramento by the time he opens up any angry emails. Uh, but, uh, but I just, uh, I really just want to echo my thanks and appreciation to those going into to serve in our military. May God keep his hand upon you and a legion of angels around you, and may you return with just a, a testimony and uh, seeing the fingerprints of, that he's put on your life and his deliverance and protection for you. Pastor Bill, thank you again for the honor of being here. I apologize, I didn't ask you to do this, but we wanted to pray for Israel right now. And um, I, I think you would be the one that would be most helpful if you would lead us in prayer um, for Israel, as you know, as God's led, God's, God leads you right now in prayer. So would you please pray? And would you please join us as we pray for this nation that God has called as his chosen people. They were special because he called them. Remember that. And we want to honor him and what he's doing. So let's let's pray for the nation. Let's do before we do, let me just put a disclaimer out. Praying being pro Israel is not synonymous with being anti Arab. Amen. It's not it is not synonymous with being anti Muslim. A lot of people can't reconcile that. So as we enter into prayer, let's keep that as a disclaimer that be, just because you're praying for the peace of Jerusalem doesn't mean that you're wishing the ill will for anyone else. So, Lord, Father, we do, we submit this prayer, and we know that, uh, we know that it's not our military, and it's not the United Nations, and it's not the European Union, it's not CUFI that is the defender of Israel, it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's you yourself that is the defender of Israel, and we, we ask you that if there's any Gideons in our midst, if there's any Esthers in our midst, if there's any Richard Nixons in our midst, if there's anybody that wants to Pray for the peace of Jerusalem like we never have or ever will, just uh, not doing it so that we would prosper, but just doing it so that uh, we would fulfill your command to do so. We know that uh, you surround your people like the mountains surround Jerusalem, that you are a hedge of protection for them. But we ask you that if there are those seeds that have been planted today, if there's a curiosity or a, a, a thirst, to better appreciate the Jewish roots of our faith and to better appreciate how we can tangibly bless our elder brother, your firstborn, then we ask you to nurture and cultivate those seeds and to uh, bring understanding, even revelation. And uh, you don't do parlor tricks. Uh, when we seek to bless them, it isn't so that we get something or that we'd be blessed, Lord Father. We do it out of obedience and we do it with a, with a pure heart and a, and a, and a pure spirit. And we just ask you that you would indulge us and that you would just uh, just show the manifestation of, of the truth of your word. That when we do receive those blessings, when we do see your hand upon things, that we realize that you do and it's not us. But Lord, the spiritual wounds that our predecessors inflicted, allow us with our unconditional love, allow us with our deeds, Allow us with our words to our Jewish friends. Allow us with our unspoken thoughts to be a salve on those wounds, that they would heal, that, uh, that you would begin the reconciliation process between your firstborn and those that Jesus Christ came to welcome into the kingdom. And so we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you've yet to do, and we ask you to allow us to be a small part of it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you.